Thank you, sir. Thank you, Glenn. My name is Ralph White. I am an alcoholic. And thank you for the invitation. And uh, I'd like to welcome anybody who identified early. And I especially want to reach out to you, JC. You didn't look too thrilled about the proceedings at this point. I get it. Eight days back and probably still doing a lot of soul searching, a lot of self ass kicking, a lot of remorse, um, a lot of why try, why try, you know, I've tried this thing and I found it wanting. It's interesting and it's a, it's a cold feeling because as we know, and I say it all the time, you know, on this island of misfit toys, I'm a misfit in the misfits. And that is a dark, lonely place. It's good if it's dark and it's good if it's lonely. You know, uh, in Bill Wilson's story, he talked about how dark it is before the dawn. And I think if it doesn't get real, 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 real dark, at least for a guy like me, uh, I stay in it. I stay in it. Uh, so, uh, bad news first, it ain't going to get better. I know a lot of people want to be very encouraging and say, we're glad you're, it ain't going to get better, Jason. If I keep doing what I've been doing, I'm going to keep getting what I've been getting. It ain't going to be better. But I got good news. There is a solution. There is a way out. I got some more bad news. We're it. I say that tongue in cheek. At one time, I did think like that. This is it. This is the way out. This is the solution. This is what I'm going to have to do. In Bill's story, he talked about when Dr. Silkworth gave him and Lois the news, dude's going to you know, get a black dress, Lois. You're going to have to put him. You're going to have to bury him, lock him up in the nut house. He's going to be talking to himself. He's going to be you're one of them guys. you know. And Bill said, I almost welcome the news. Here I was to join the endless procession of sots. You know, Bill is a drama queen, so he writes like that. The endless procession of sots. And the thing about it for a guy like me, when I signed up for this outfit, I thought, here I was to join the endless procession of sots, squares, People who, you know, ain't going to be no cussing, no chasing, no doing nothing that I like to do. Yeah, I know I'm a prop. You have to turn myself in. I've been spending the whole paycheck every two weeks. I'm on. I'm this close to being put out. Matter of fact, I'm out the house. I'm no longer this close. I'm out of the house. Uh, I can't hold a job. I don't see my girl for Christmas. You know, all of this stuff. And I, okay, I get it. My life is tore up. But now I got to sign up for this crew right here, slick as I am. You know, the thought, you know, the way I like you getting down and the way I like partying and all the things that I thought, which I hadn't been doing, by the way. You know, I like party. I like social. I, I wasn't doing any of that. But here I was to join the endless obsession. And little did I know. You know, was I to be consigned to a life that's dull and boring, and, you know, mm -mm -mm. and in our chapter vision for you, you know, it talks about that. And it says, have you a sufficient substitute? JC, yes, sir, we do. And it is the fellowship of alcoholics and alcoholics. And the best years of your life probably lie in front of you. You know, if you come in here, sit all the way down, you know, and do what it is that we do, you know, and, um, my sobriety date is October the 11th, 1986. Grew up in Los Angeles, California. I grew up um, with a dad who was an alcoholic. He was not in the house, you know, very long in my childhood. He was gone probably by the time I was eight or nine. Mom raised six boys by herself. Got a, uh, I enjoyed growing up. You know, sometimes people think that the description of alcoholism is circumstance and situation. So we spend a lot of time on that in our stories. And 
it's good we spend a lot of time in that on our stories, but it's bad in the sense that people start getting the mistaken idea that it's the circumstance and the situation that's the description of alcoholism, because it ain't. It's plenty of people that grow up feeling separate and apart from the rest of their family. It's plenty of people that grow up suffering some form of what they may think of as abuse inside the family. There's plenty of people that grow up with shattered dreams and goals and hopes. There's plenty of people that grow up being told they're not going to mount to any. There's plenty of people that grow up like that. But a small percentage of the population has this body difference that I have, this allergic reaction to alcohol. You know, And so a key component of alcoholism is drinking alcohol. You know, and that is a, that's a factor. The physical factor is big. And so uh, I'm alcoholic for two reasons and two reasons only. One, when I take one, I can't tell you how, when I'm going to stop. And two, when I sincerely don't want to put it in me and start it up again, I put it in me and start it up again anyway. I'm bodily and mentally different from the majority of the population. And uh, that's, that's critical. You know, didn't know it, didn't start out that way, uh, liked my childhood, didn't have money. Uh, I had a lot of brothers. We had a lot of camaraderie, you know, uh, in the 60s growing up, kids still did a lot of stuff outside. I played ball all day. I was real good in school. I had a lot of friends. Um, so I've never, but internally, I've, I have always felt if you really know me, you won't like me. So I'm a surface guy. I skate on the surface in relationships. You know, uh, I don't, you know, I, I have some secrets because I'm a secret keeper, you know, and, and one of the secrets is it never feels like to me that I feel as deeply as it looks like the rest of you do. I don't know how you really feel, but I know how it looks like you feel. When my granddaddy died in 19. 85 or 84, I forget which year. And he was my guy. And I wanted to manufacture this doubled over, you know, fetal position crying. And I couldn't make it happen. Scared myself. It scared me. Uh, I wondered, did I have a capacity for true feelings? I still have uh, some questioning of that because I don't often, I see the way some people respond and react to tragedies in life or to hurts. And uh, uh, I've seldom been put in that position. Uh, I'm a, I might revisit that in a little while, I don't know. Um, but anyway, so I'm growing up like that man. Uh, high achieving guy, goal setter. You know, I, I always set goals and um, I always had ideas I'd reach them. And because I'm, I'm accustomed to uh, pats on the back and I'm accustomed to uh, achieving. I, I get out of school and uh, I go to college at 18, uh, still in Los Angeles, but it felt like it was a continent away because I'm 18 years old and I'm grown. And I go off to UCLA and I live in the dorms and that's when my drinking started. And I had taken drinks here and there before then, but in earnest, it started when I went off to college. And um, although I was late to the party, you guys, uh, I was 18 years old. When I got there, uh, it was on. Uh, I'm a, you know, I'm drinking, and you know what youngsters are drinking at 18: Tyrolia, Spinata, Boone's Farm, Annie Green Springs, you know. Uh, uh, brass Bunky, Southern Comfort was my drink of choice for mixing drinks. Gin and Roses Lime Juice later on became my staple. You know, I like tequila. I, you know, I, I'm drinking. And yeah, I'm not one of these hard drinking, you know, go to the bar with the sawdust on the, no, don't be cutting your stuff with, no, cut mine. I don't like the taste. Of, I'm never scotch. Woo. I don't know how y'all were handling that. You know, that's that's some serious drinking right there. And uh, but I'm cutting mine. You know, sometimes people get mad if you cut some Hennessy or if you cut some Cavassier. Sometimes I'll do it smooth like some Remy, but some I'm putting some Coke in it. So what? Um, but I'm getting mine in, right? And so I'm drinking. 
so 71, I'm drinking, I'm smoking commercial weed. By 72, I'm drinking and the quality of weed went up. I think I was, I think I started smoking Colombian probably in about 73 or four, I can't remember, um, Thai and, and some book. And uh, so by 73, the progression of the disease of alcoholism in my life, I'm running with a fast crew and I'm at a major university and I'm an image guy, right? So I'm always doing whatever the sign of the times is. I'm a club guy. I'm a partying guy. Um, I'm not... Um, I'm not a, a Romeo or Casanova. I'm not a walk in and leave with the girl on the first day, but I'm a guy that comes in and now I got, you know, something that you want. I'm, so I'm, I'm a fun loving guy, man. And uh, so of course by 1972 and 73, if you running with a fast crowd, you know, what comes with that is, you know, uh, some Kavasi, some rim, you know, beef eaters, some high end, you know, how, for me at least. I didn't know anything about some of the other stuff later on. But for me, and being 19, 20, and 21, some high end drinking, some smoking the best weed, I'm snorting cocaine in 1973, because of course, that's what you do in 1973 when you got a little piece of money. I was getting financial aid. You know, that's, that's, that's what you do. And if you running with a fast crew, I'm running with people we were going to see playing in the NFL on Sundays, running with people we're going to see in the NBA, running with people who were going to be political leaders in my state, in my town, in this country, running with people who were going to be captains of industry, and I'm going to be one of them. I'm going to be one of them. Couldn't have told me, you know. But uh, I'm described in our chapter, there is a solution. There's a paragraph that says, but what about the real alcoholic? I don't know how I'm described in that paragraph. I think I'm described in the paragraph before that one that describes the heavy drinker given a sufficient, given a sufficient reason to stop or moderate. I thought when I started suffering some L's in the mid 70s, I thought, okay, when I grow up, I'm come up out of this foolishness and I'm gonna slow it down. I'm gonna start a family, I'm gonna start a career, I'm gonna get in this. And I'm gonna slow it down. I don't know that I got this thing. Not that it would have mattered if I had known I had this thing, but I got this thing. And so even though my boys, when we graduated from school, they started grad school, started families, started careers. Uh, I'm in that, I got that thing. And it got progressive, you know? And um, so I'm I, by now in the mid seventies, Late 70s, uh, it's, it's, it's got your boy. It's got me. But I don't know it. Uh, my sponsor, who is Bob B. out of St. Paul, Minnesota, always says that life is lived forward and understood backwards. So you can't, you know, uh, I can't see what drugs and alcohol are doing to me when I'm in the mix. I can only see it in the rearview mirror of experience. So it's most of what I share with you guys now which are crystal clear to me looking back in the rear view were not at all clear to me when I was experiencing them. One of the things that's clear to me is when I walked down the aisle in April of 1980 and, and took this girl's hand, my college sweetheart, I was already way across the line and the wheels were already, I was on rims, you know, because I'm drinking, I'm, I'm drinking 1000. I'm smoking weed every day. I done already graduated from snorting cocaine to smoking cocaine. So you, those of you who know about that life know that I was already on rims. The wheels had been off and we walked down the aisle and uh, that had been my college sweetheart. And we thought we would have a great life together. Uh, I was a catch in 1971, two and three. I was a young brother with a bright future, uh, really ambitious, really had some stuff going on. I had, at that time, I had started dabbling some in some politics and was working for politics and just, and was doing some things, man. I'm the one that uh, you did take home to meet mom. You know, because I'm yes, sir, yes, ma'am. I'm that guy, you know, and I'm the one that said, quit messing with that Al, you know, and then that, that bad woman. Why can't you give it to a guy like Ralph? I'm him, you know, and uh, uh, but by 1980, man, uh, the gorilla was having his way with your boy. 
and uh, my college sweetheart, who still have memories of that guy, you know, made the mistake that Saturday morning, Saturday afternoon in April of 1980, she made the mistake of hitching her wagon to a guy like me. And guys like me are heartbreakers. Not a bad boy. Uh, I don't put my hands on you. Uh, I don't call you out your name. But I tear you up. I break you down. I disappoint you all the time. I give you sleepless nights. I embarrass you. I make you feel bad about feeling bad about me because glimmers of that guy comes up every now and then. Uh, I learned all this uh, as a result of doing amends to my first wife. Um, she said, Ralph, I am so glad to see you doing okay right now. But there's a piece of me that wants you to hurt like I hurt. And I don't like feeling that way. But I don't want you. But it feel like I took all your shit and somebody else is going to get the best of you. And I don't like feeling that way about myself. Uh, guys like me are heartbreakers, man. And so we get into that marriage and we have a baby in May of 1983. Uh, Rain White. My baby will be 40 this year. And uh, we have a baby and I want to be a daddy man. I want to be a real good dad to my to my daughter, because I didn't have a dad. And, uh, but I'm in it in 1983, man. I'm, I'm, I'm deep in it, I'm deep in it. I'm so deep in it, you know, that uh, it results in me being put out in 1985. My daughter was a year and a half and I get put out of the house in 1985. And uh, I go to stay at my mom's house and my five brothers are in the life too. And we all are getting loaded together. Me and my brothers were always tight. Uh, and uh, and uh, it, it was ugly the year of 85. I had staggered through the early 80s, still doing a Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde. Uh, as my alcoholism was growing, I was also ascending in the workplace. Uh, I was working again for this politician and and actually regional director of this political organization in 82. Uh, I, I never share that part of so, You know, well, our stories disclose in a general way because in 40 minutes or 50 minutes or an hour, we don't have time to tell you every single aspect of it. And so most of us focus on the alcohol because that's what we're here to talk about. So we focus on those aspects. But inside of that, one of the reasons why I think my mom and put up with me and my brother so long is because uh, in real time, it was a relatively short period of time, but in, in alcoholism years, it's like dog years. Alcoholism years are like, you. it's like 10 years for one year. You know what I'm saying? And um, cause actually, I, you know, I always talk about my mom and be, and actually I didn't inflict direct on my mom, except for over a couple of years. I moved back into her house in 85. I came to you guys in 86. And my brothers, me, Ronnie, and Reggie had built up so much equity. I think that's what saved my mom from going. It took her a minute before she, and she never totally gave up on us because we had had so many years of her sticking her chest out about our boys. And, you know, one after the other, student body president, class president, most outstanding graduate, go off to school, make her proud. And so we had built up a lot of equity, you guys. So when you guys think about, we hear from the white boy, we hear about their mom, poor mom, how did she put up with this for so long? We had built up a lot of equity. And so it wasn't until, the, and when we went off to school and were doing our own things, you know, my mom never saw an apartment I lived in, never, never. From the time I left home until I got married, 
My mom had never been nowhere. Because you can't come over to my house. It's gonna always be some uh it's gonna always be some drinking, some smoking, some women, some something. You can't come over to my house, you know. And uh anyway, I don't know why I went down that road. So uh in eighty five, uh I had got fired from I was living in my mom's house, I got fired from my dream job. I'm now work walking the, the aimless walk uh every night. And from 85 to 86, it got really, 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 really bleak. And uh, uh, the night of October 10th of 1986, some things transpired that um, culminated with me dodging a black truck the morning of October the 11th, 1986. Uh, knocked on my mom's back door. She let me in the house on the condition that I told her, I thought I was lying at the time. I said, mom, if you let me in the house, I promise I'm going in the program where Ronnie is. My brother Ron had been in the Harbor Light since July of that year. Ronnie had about 80 some days, I guess, still in the Harbor Light. And we located the yellow pages and found the number to the light and they located Ronnie and got him on the phone. I, said, tell mom, you got a bed for me there. And Ronnie got excited. I'm sure they can get a bed for you. And I thought I was lying and God was putting words in my mouth that I didn't know he was putting in my mouth. And for years, I said, I came in here on a lie. And that was a lie because I told my mom, if you let me in the house, that she let me in the house, I promise I'll go up in the program. And I went up in the program. And the rest is history. And uh, I'm a firm believer, you know, that uh, JC, you don't know uh, how grace shows up in your life. And usually it doesn't look the way I think it's going to look. Usually angels come dressed as police. Usually they come and they look like uh, uh, all my clothes on the front lawn. That does not look like a very, you know, that does not look like grace to me. Um, bracelets on, on, on wrists don't look like grace. You know, it doesn't feel like grace when they tell you, take this brown box and walk up out of here and here, take this last check with you. That does not seem like grace. Uh, but the power of the power. And for all of us, you know, we all had that how dark it is before the dawn moment. I always, and I sit back and I just marvel at the way that God does what it is that he does anonymously. And it's not until looking back, I try to, you know, I, I think about that and how when I do something, I want recognition in the moment. I'm doing something for you, baby. In the moment, you need to know it. And the way that God works is so amazing to me because in the moment, those moments are the moments that feel the most crushing when he's putting his hands on me. Those moments are the moments that feel like the worst ever. Those moments are the moments that I would just, man, what the, I, this is the worst day of my life. And it's not until sometimes years later Maybe in the middle of you telling your story, you say, wait a minute. I was listening to somebody uh, the other day on Zoom, and she was sharing, and was sharing, oh, at my workshop, and she was sharing for her birthday, and she said she was in a motel, and, and she was in a motel with a guy, and the guy went downstairs to buy some cigarettes or something and got popped. Police busted him. He sent the police up to the room and she gets busted. Go off to jail for years. And she was mad at him and she was taking her cake. And she and it was, I don't know if it was dawning on her for the first time, but she talked about in the rearview mirror, seeing him for who he was. He was her Eskimo. He was her angel. It was the best day of her life, JC. And it felt like the worst day. It was the best day of my life when that black truck 
I believe, was chasing me. I ain't talked to him yet. He might have just been driving through the neighborhood. I did owe him money. So he probably, and I did jump in the bushes twice when I saw that truck circling. But the best, I didn't know that was an angel coming after me. I thought that that was God coming at I didn't know. I didn't know God was chasing me and chasing me up to you guys. And so when grace comes calling, uh, that October in 86, man, it's been my job ever since. Uh, cooperate with it. Uh, I don't create the grace. We don't produce the grace. We can't predict the grace. We don't control the grace. But every single one of us have come to rely on it. And um, that's what I think I'm going to talk to you about right now, JC. What I've discovered in these 36 years that I've been on this path with you guys. I started uh, by doing some self-esteem building tasks. The first thing I did um, when I went up into the Harbor Life program was I, I set some small achievable goals, small ones, achievable ones that were reasonable and doable for me. I went in that treatment program, man, and I said, I had been in three programs before, and this program is a 90-day program. I'm not leaving early no matter what. I don't care what they say. I stayed in there 120 days. I said, another small achievable goal, no matter what they do, if they give me extra duty, whether it's, whether it's warranted or not, whether I agree with them or not, I'm going to do everything they say to do up in here. Why? Because I bought this. If I'm in the house with a family that still let me be in the house and they seem to be persecuting me for no reason and they seem to be, I bought this. I'm 33 years old. I bought this. Nobody else did. And so I would pick out the one or two times with, wait, how dare you say that? I didn't leave that. No, 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 no. So no matter what, I'm staying here. I'm going to do everything it is that they say to do. Small, achievable tasks. When I get 30 days and they allow us to go to a meeting, I'm going to a meeting every single night. And I went to a meeting every single night night. I know I'm not a person that's going to lay up and be like, oh man, because it's not in our book, obviously everybody knows it, but one of the popular suggestions in Alcoholics Anonymous from a lot of people is don't get in a relationship in your first year. That's not a bad or good suggestion. Uh, people come in in relationships often, so that a fracture and shatter need to go back to, so at any rate, uh, and I'm, I'm not taking a stance on that, but people say that. And it's an incomplete sentence at best. What people really mean is folk like us tend to get in and hook up with somebody and make that my primary purpose. I make that my higher power. I put that in front of folk, the main. So what they really want to say, JC, is keep the main thing the main thing. And the main thing when I was new was getting sober, get the gorilla off the block. You know, people put a lot of other stuff later, but sometimes when I'm down the road a piece, I forget the power of the gorilla, just get the taste out of my mouth. And so, you know, I say it, because I knew I wouldn't be celibate for, for the first year, but I didn't want to, I also, because I was 33 and, and I knew some stuff about me, and I knew I wasn't material for anything. So I'm going to get with somebody, but I'm not going to be serious. And when I started dating, one of the things said small achievable goals. I said, we're not going out. At that time, um, VCR, you, you could just start, I think, renting movies maybe and, and that kind of stuff. And I remember saying to this girl, and I said it to her, I, we will not go out if I don't go to a meeting first. For one of the few times, and I don't know where I got the power because I am not a, uh, uh, I'm not a lay down the law, I'm, you know, especially when I'm that fractured 
and I'm not bringing a lot to the table. So a lot of times I like who likes me when I'm in that situation. And I tend to do follow the leader when I'm in that situation. But for whatever reason, you know, and I knew this wasn't that serious who I was dealing with. And I was, but I was like, and I said it. I said, we should agree on this. Now, she didn't follow through with that. And then I don't know where she is to this day. The first person I started seeing in sobriety, and it was a really short fling. I was staying in a halfway house, but, but it served its purpose. But at any rate, I remember telling Paula, I will not go, we will not go out on a date. A date will be deserved. Keep the main thing, the main thing. If I don't go to a meeting, I don't get to go to a movie. If I don't go to a meeting, we don't get to stay home and watch a movie. And I, you guys, I went to a meeting every day. I went to about three meetings a day in my first year because I went 18 months without a job. Small, achievable task. And I set the marks and I said it, I'm gonna do it. I had not, here's something I don't recommend because there's a lot of power in the humility of standing up and being new. Since I was in a treatment facility for 30 days, you know, I was in there being new. So by the time I started going to Alcoholics Anonymous meetings, I didn't have to stand up and take newcomer chips. Now, there's a power in standing up and taking a newcomer chip, JC. But I'm sharing my story. And so my story went like this. I had made, I had gotten 90 day chips before and that's the most I had gotten you know, the most I had ever gotten. So I said, I'm not taking any other chip until I get to six months. You know, I'm not saying that for any of you guys, just telling you my story, you know? And so I couldn't wait. And so small, achievable things. Started going to a meeting at uh, 9604 South Figueroa at night. And I went to the Crenshaw and Lotto Club in the, uh, in the daytime at noon. And I had a regular schedule of meetings, you guys. I still remember that. You know, I still remember being dedicated to this deal like that. Uh, on, uh, on Sunday, you know, there was a 3.30 meeting at my home group, 9604 South Figueroa, the Young at Heart meeting. And then they had a big book meeting on Sunday evening. On Mondays, I was going to a meeting of CA called The Solution. You know, on Tuesdays, I was going to 9604 South Figueroa, my home group, the Tuesday night, 830 meeting. On Wednesdays, I would go to the relapse preventing prevention meeting of CA, a huge meeting. They used to call it dog and pony show. People would come out dressed, looking, Jason, but we were coming out and hungry and eager. And you made this thing look good for me. I'm not one of these people that mashes and bashes on the dancers in the room. I'm a guy that you got to, this thing looked good to me. It looked fun to me. It looked attractive to me. Don't be hitting me over the head with, you need to get into the, the no, 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 I'm not ready. Mm -mm. And I, I, what I got into was the AA way of life. And it became a lifestyle for me. On Thursday night, I went to the Broadway group of Alcoholics Anonymous, my home group, 9604 South Figueroa. And my first year after I took a year cake there, I became the assistant secretary. That was the biggest meeting in the hall. We had standing room only that night. My third year there, I was the assistant secretary to my boy, uh, the late Leon Strange. And the year after that, I became secretary of the Broadway group, uh, the biggest group in my home group, uh, the 9604 South Figueroa. On Friday nights, I went to the Crenshaw and Lotto Club, the speaker meeting at the Crenshaw and Lotto Club. Sometime I went to the candlelight meeting at 9604 South Figueroa. On Saturdays, I would go to the 9604 now South Figueroa noon meeting. I would go to the Crenshaw and Lotto Club Saturday night speaker meeting. And I had a regular group of me that to this day, I can tell you where I was and where you'll find me. Every day at noon, I would either be at the Crenshaw Lotto Club. On Wednesdays, I would be at the Mini House. You know, on Thursdays, I'd be at the House of Yehudi. And so I had a regular set of meetings, you guys. When you go to a regular set of meetings, you start seeing a regular group of people. And this one guy I kept seeing, you know, and he saw me one day and he gave me a ride home. And when he dropped me off at home, he said, I know where you're going to be tomorrow because we would always be there. He said, why don't you let me pick you up? And Leon Strange picked me up that day, the next day, and me and that man started a journey. 
that lasted until he passed away. You know, outside of my brothers, uh, probably the closest person to me in Alcoholics Anonymous, Leon Strange, the late Greg Little, uh, just people, man, who touched me. And uh, the AA way of life, you know, they got close, as close to me, man, and we started doing this damn thing. Uh, I can remember uh, Strange had been in an accident, uh, almost broke his back on his motorcycle, was down, so he got a big settlement. And uh, in those days, there are some things that are not in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, for JC and anybody else that's new. And I want you to put these in your simple kit of spiritual tools. First thing I want you to do, if you don't have one, you know, get a sobriety day. Get a sobriety day. For most of us here, because we've been celebrating and we think about it, we think that's, that's crazy. Everybody has one. But if you've been trying to get sober several times, you know, like I did. I didn't, I didn't know whether or not I was going to be so, so I didn't mark the date. I didn't mark the date. I had to think back. When I had been sober about three weeks, I said, oh shit, when did I come in the harbor light? You know, and I, I had to think back, you know, and the truth of the matter, you guys, is I was getting loaded on the 10th into the 11th. My sobriety date is October the 11th. And so I started saying, I wonder, should it be October the 11th? Because that morning, I believe I probably still had something in me, or should it be October the 12th when I start with my no, I was cleaning so, and so I was wrestling back and forth in the harbor like these many years later, as you're telling me, and I picked October the 11th because I like the symmetry, because my natal birthday is 9-11. And so 10, 11, 9, 11, and that's how I, you know, but I mark back. So if you haven't, if there's anybody here that's new and you're not sure that you want to sign up for this outfit, think back to when your angel showed up, when they put the handcuffs on you or when your clothes were on the lawn or whatever it is, try to get back to a market, get a sobriety day. If you ain't got one, you don't have one. Next thing I want you to do is, you know, get a home group. A home group is something like a cheers bar, somewhere you go where everybody know your name. Now, a lot of people, especially new, have been getting sober on Zoom. And Zoom for me is amazing. It is an amazing uh, 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 art, another big uh, uh, arrow in my quiver. You know, it's something else that I have because I'm an addition guy. I, I ain't throwing away nothing that I like. So I, it's not a replacement for like it's just something else that I have. But for those of you who got familiar with us on Zoom, I want to issue you an invitation. I want to issue you an invitation to go out to a live meeting. There's nothing like standing in the circle. There's nothing like getting the AA hug at the beginning or at the end of a meeting. There's nothing like standing in the real parking lot. When you do the parking lot on Zoom, everybody's burglarizing your conversation. It's not real parking lot because everybody is privy to, you know, there's nothing like having a member take you to the side like they did me. Like my sponsor, Bob Hunt, my first sponsor, you know, uh, did me. And he put me in the car with him and his boy, Latif. And both of them had about nine years. And they took a young brother named Ralph. And I, I had my months. And they put me in the back seat. And I listened to them spin stories in the front seat. Both of them had been in the nut house. And they talked about doing the Thorazine shuffle. And they talked about the Miller Reel twist. And, and they talked about the early days for them at Alcoholics Anonymous. And they talked about some of the people who were old timers in the group that weren't so old when they first came around. And I was fascinated. And I was, I, and they knew my name. And these two guys were guys respected in our AA community. And they took me in. They took me in. And they let me in the car. And we would go eat. And I didn't have no money. And they knew I didn't have no money. And they left, they, you know, and, and they left me my dignity. They never looked at me when the check came. And that's my Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, and that's what we do. So get a home group. Uh, 
They didn't get a sponsor. And as a sponsor, you know, that's the highest calling for me in Alcoholics Anonymous. I call it one of my default settings. You know, uh, there are lots of things that uh, when you get on this path, and, and in my 36 years, man, I've never thought of leaving Alcoholics Anonymous. Never. Never. We read something in the workshop not long ago, and it said, the minute I decided, well, I think we were reading Fred's story, and he said, the minute I decided to go through with the process, I had the curious sensation that my alcoholism, I had the curious sensation in the harbor life. I had, the minute I decided with those self-esteem building tasks I told you guys about, I said, I'm going through with this. The minute I decided I'm going through with it, I had the curious sensation. And I'm ne that sensation has never left me. From the time I signed up, I've never yet thought about leaving you guys. It has not been hard for me to be a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. The life has it sent me some challenges. But being a member is the easiest thing that there is. And the other thing that's been easy for me is not picking one up because I ain't responsible for that. God took the taste out of my mouth and it hasn't returned. And that's not something I did. You know, he took the taste out of my mouth and it hasn't returned. So, you know, uh, it has not been hard for me to be a member over these years, you know, but it's some of the things that have been put in front of me have been challenging. And uh, so there are some things I put into place for myself. You know, a lot of people, uh, a lady was he, on here and right before the meeting, she said, I, I'm showing up because I want to hear Ralph talk and the rest of that. And, and I appreciate that. And I'm grateful for that. And, and I don't shy away from what God has given me over these years. You know, I don't uh, abdicate my position. I've been here 36 years, so I'm an example. You know, that's not a choice of mine. That just is a reality. I'm an example of what this program uh, and what this power can do with a life if you turn it over to it. I'm an example of what recovery looks like in day-to-day -day living. I'm an example of falling down and getting up, you know, um, of not necessarily an example of always getting it right. I'm not necessarily an example of, of uh, flawless performance, you know. Uh, but I've often said, if you ask me to grade my paper, I think I get an A in one area. And that is one of my favorite words in the book, one of my favorite descriptors. You know, we don't always call it one of the spiritual principles, but it is a principle that has served me well. Persistence. If, you, if we persist, also is a remarkable thing. I'm a persister. No matter, I, I, I persist. You know, and one of the ways that allows me to persist through good and bad times through stormy weather and fair. One of the things that allows me is I have some default settings. And one of my default settings is sponsorship, you know, and that one will serve you well. You know, it will do for you what you can't do for yourself. When you go into a situation, there will be times in recovery when you may not feel like showing up. You may not feel like being at a place where somebody else is going to be. God damn it. I don't want to go there. She or he is going to be there. But I got to go because that's where my sponsees are. I got to go because that's my home group. I got to go because that's my commitment. And it'll do for me what I can't do for myself. My very life as an ex-problem drinker depends on my constant thought of others and how I can meet their needs. Well, if that's my default setting, you know, um, I won't be able to survive the certain trials and low spots, you know, if I don't enlarge and perfect my spiritual life through self-sacrifice and working with others. You know, if that's my default setting, if sex is particularly troublesome, we throw ourselves into working with others. If that's where I always got to go. If after my 10th step, you know, I find out, I discuss and I make amends, then I resolutely turn my attention to somebody I could help. Well, if the setting 
is always somebody I can help. If practical experience shows nothing ensures immunity from drinking, like work with another alcoholic, well, wait a goddamn minute. Everything is find somebody, find somebody. It's good to be connected to somebody so you ain't got to go looking. It's good to not be unmoored from the fellowship so you ain't got to now say, well, who can I work with? It's good to have a default setting, a home group, and damn it, sponsorship. It is a, you know, it, it has done more for me than uh, I can express. You know, I'm sponsored, you know, and I, and I sponsor. And the thing about sponsoring you guys, it will incrementally increase your own spiritual development way more than you can on your, it's like your money can make money for you faster than you can make money. If you invested your money, it can make your spiritual investment, your sponsorship can do more for you than you can do by yourself. Because every time you sit with somebody and they give you the privilege and they open the door to their life and you sit down and you listen and you say, damn, you know, and internally you say, oh, shit, I don't know about that one. And externally you say, God got you. It's going to be all right. You don't know. And then you sit in the front row and watch it play out and be all right. And there's a certainty that happens when one alcoholic is talking to another. All of you guys on here who sponsor know you've heard something come out of your mouth that you didn't know was in your mouth. And it can only come out of your mouth in that divine uh, alchemy, right? It, it's only that relationship right there that will bring it out. If you were driving by yourself, it would never come out. If you were talking to your kids, that would when they came out. If you were talking to your own sponsor, that would when they came out. If you were talking to your boy, that would when they came out. But if you were talking to that specific sponsor about that specific deal at that specific time, there's something that happens and God comes up in there and it's always a trio. It's never a duet. It's always the unseen third sitting in there and something takes place. And I get an opportunity to see not only and have not only my own spiritual experiences, it gets dull for me sometimes, meaning it gets peaceful. Over the years, I ain't been kicking up as much dust. I haven't had as much stuff happening all the time. Thank God. Then I do have things that happen, thank God. But when I don't, I always got some way to see the power of the power right in front of me because I'm actively sponsoring. And it has done more for me than I can tell you. And so I encourage you to be actively sponsored and to do active sponsoring. It's an anchor. It's an anchor. It'll, it'll do for you what you can't do for yourself. It's a default setting. It's something that people say, I want to come hear this guy. Say, oh, really? What you get from me is really just a compilation. I'm a composite. I'm not an original. I'm a composite. I get the opportunity to sit at the feet of some of the best communicators in our program. I get the opportunity to sit at the feet and to interact with some people who have what it is that I want and who allow me. And so I get it and I get the opportunity to interact with some amazing, amazing, amazing members and sponsees. And so what I do when I get that, I'm, I'm good at remembering. And so I just bring it back. I'm a composite. I'm not an original. You know, when me and Chris sit down, you may get some of our conversation coming back to you guys. When me and my boy, when me and Bob, my sponsor sit down, you guys get some of that. You know, when I got the opportunity to sit with Sandy Beach and Tom Iverson, and I got the opportunity to be with the great Howard P and Clancy and, 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 and Marilyn, you guys get to get some of that. You know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a guy that loves this deal, you know, and you also get to get some of what happens when I sit with Arrow, you know, Gravelli and Artist Gravelli, my grandsons, you know, you get to get what happens when I sit with Rain White, uh, Rain Gravelli, okay, Rain, okay, I, I apologize, somebody else got you now, and River White, you get to get some of that, you get to get some of what happens when I get the wisdom of my mom. You get to get some of that. And uh, I get to get grateful for it. I get to get grateful for the life I've been given. 
I get to get grateful for the fact that you guys want to hear from me about the life that I've been given. And I get to get grateful for the power that took a guy like me, you know, way back October 1986. And I stepped into my assignment just to the extent that I play the role he assigns. And it varies and it changes. And I stepped into the assignment. Wow. And what a life. You know, uh, damn, Glenn, you should have stopped me. I'm already over it. And if God had brought you from where he brought me, you talk about him all day long, too. My name is Ralph White. I am an alcoholic.